Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our hearing of the City Council's Committee on Parks and Recreation. Uh, I'm Mark Levine, your chair. We're going to be hearing two bills today, one that I am pleased to sponsor, which is intro 1680, that will significantly improve the level of reporting um, required by the Parks Department on capital projects, and a second bill whose lead sponsor is our majority leader, Jimmy Van Bramer, and that is intro 1466, relating to pesticides in playgrounds, um, which he will be speaking on when he joins us. This is a busy day for the council. We have a big hearing on um, uh, a little matter over at NYCHA, which uh, uh, is um, occupying many of our colleagues at this moment. Um, so I'm going to say a few words on, on intro 1680 uh, before we pass it off to the administration. This is, um, uh, this is yet another uh, effort to tackle the biggest challenge that uh, we believe the department faces, which is uh, the time it takes to complete capital projects and the, the cost involved in capital projects. And um, when we delve into this to our, our last hearing, we, um, we hit upon some inconsistencies between uh, the way the Parks Department reports on capital projects uh, and the Mayor's Management Report and the way we as council members and the public perceive them. And it took a while to unpack, but what we learned is that the Department reports on the construction phase exclusively when it uh, reports on on-time and on-budget success and therefore has a very high uh, on-time and on-budget rate, I guess 85% on-time, 87% percent at or under budget, but truth is there are actually four phases to a capital project. Um, there's there's the, the pre-design phase, uh, which begins when the public learns the good news that a project has been funded. Uh, it usually appears in the press and our newsletters. Then there's a phase um, for procurement, sorry, for design. Then there's a third phase for procurement, and finally uh, a construction phase leading up to the to the ribbon cutting. And management 101, you can't manage what you're not measuring. So we think it's critical that we measure the, the full breadth of the capital project process. And that is the intent behind our bill. Um, I should note that one thing that's grown out of our concern and the and administration shared concern about the capital process is a, a task force that um, has been underway comprised of a number of council leaders, including um, our chair of finance, uh, Jalissa Ferris Copeland, myself, um, council member Brad uh, Lander, council member Andy Cohen, uh, council member Helen Rosenthal, Debbie Rose, uh, and I think that's it, uh, along with uh, leaders from various departments of the administration, not only parks, but I think uh, half a dozen others, law department as well, um, to look at every aspect of the capital process. And so, some, some recommendations have emerged out of that. Um, it's, still, it's still very early on in, in early days for the task force, but um, one relates to Local Law 63, which requires a 60-day waiting period, um, uh, I believe during period of public comment, and we've talked about reducing or eliminating that. So. Uh, progress on the horizon there, uh, but we continue to believe that accurate information and reporting available to us as policymakers and the public as well uh, is essential to getting this under control. Uh, and that's our intent behind Intro 1680. So I'm going to pause now and pass it off to the administration uh, before we uh, allow for questions from the folks on our side, and I'm going to ask our committee counsel, Chris Sartori, to administer the uh, the affirmation. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today? I do. <clears throat> Let, before, I, I did not acknowledge our stalwart, um, ever present, and always witty colleague on the Parks Committee, Alan Maisel, who's here with us. And of course, we were joined earlier by Council Members uh, Fernando Cabrera and Andy Cohen, who are also both Parks Committee members. And with that, I'll pass it off to you, Matt. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Levine and members of the Committee on Parks and Recreation. My name is Matt Drury, Director of Government Relations at the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. 
Joining me on this panel are Marshall Brown, Director of Horticulture, and Diane Jackier, Chief of Capital Strategic Initiatives for the agency. Thank you for inviting us to testify today regarding intro 1466 pertaining to cleaning park play equipment after the spraying of pesticides and intro 1680 regarding the reporting of park capital expenditures. <clears throat> Uh, starting with intro 1466, I'd like to begin by providing some context about New York City Parks. We're the steward of approximately 29,000 acres, 14% of New York City's land mass, including 10,000 acres of natural areas. We oversee more than 5,000 individual properties, ranging from parks and playgrounds to community gardens and green streets. We operate more than 800 athletic fields and nearly 1,000 playgrounds, 66 public pools, 48 recreation facilities, 17 nature centers, and 14 miles of beaches. Each of these individual properties requires targeted maintenance, and it's important to note some of the specific challenges we face in keeping New York City's parkland in the best condition possible. In accordance with Integrated Pest Management, also known as IPM, practices and strategies, herbicide applications are used in New York City parks when other efforts will not suffice. Though our preference is to avoid the use of herbicides where possible, even in an ideal world, mechanical or manual efforts alone would neither reverse the damage done by invasive species nor support the broad-scale successful establishment of healthy, suitable plants in our parks. More nuanced and targeted strategies, including herbicide applications, are occasionally necessary for us to reverse the damage of invasive plant colonization. Though our maintenance and horticulture staff do a tremendous job keeping our parks looking their best, mechanical and manual efforts require significant resources, often requiring frequent visits to a given site several times a season, whereas a single herbicide treatment can maintain these areas for an entire season. We rarely apply herbicides in horticultural beds in parks, and we never apply herbicides in playgrounds, athletic fields, or dog runs. When it is determined that the application of herbicides or other pesticides is necessary, our staff strives to strategically target the application. Further, while applying herbicides, our trained staff typically uses a hand wand applicator at ground level to specifically target the weed. New York City Parks does not use any broad application techniques. Our goal is to directly target the weed with as little herbicide as possible. In instances where herbicide application is necessary, New York City Parks understands the importance of advance notice and transparency to ensure that local residents and park users are made aware. In accordance with state and local law, New York City Parks provides on-site notification signage 24 hours before an herbicide application is completed, and it remains up for 72 hours following the application. Intro 1466 would require the uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to develop a rule in consultation with parks to establish a minimum distance within which pesticides cannot be sprayed in proximity to playground equipment. Further, the bill would require parks to clean playground equipment in the event that pesticides are sprayed within the minimum distance established by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Since we do not use pesticides within children's playgrounds and play areas, we agree with the spirit of the legislation, but do believe the bill to be duplicative of our current practices and thus unnecessary. New York City Parks is confident that our current integrated pest management approach and compliance with federal, state, and local laws properly address safety concerns for all of our park users. Turning to Intro 1680, which addresses public information regarding parks capital projects through the agency's online capital tracker. Throughout the duration of this mayoral administration, New York City Parks has undertaken a comprehensive and focused effort to streamline every portion of the capital process within our control and to provide an unprecedented degree of public access to information about these efforts. We've seen significant and tangible improvements in our capital process, including increased efficiency and shorter delivery timelines for our projects, as well as greatly improved communication and engagement with the public and increased transparency regarding the status of our capital projects. Our online capital project tracker, launched in the fall of 2014 and codified by Local Law 98 of 2015 as Administrative Code Section 18-145, makes the capital process the most publicly transparent it's been throughout the agency's history. The tracker is an online searchable tool updated daily that allows anyone, be it an elected official, supporter of a specific park, or just your average curious New Yorker, to look up a specific park and learn more about the status of any capital project. We're proud to update the council that since the launch of the tracker, it's been viewed nearly 400,000 times. Over the past year, the tracker has been viewed nearly 150,000 times, a 35% increase in page views from the previous year, 2016. New York City Parks is constantly refining and improving our communication efforts, and we're open to discussing further improvements that council members or other stakeholders would like to see made to the capital tracker. However, we believe these potential changes and adjustments should not be codified in local law because the agency needs the flexibility to adjust the details of engagement and transparency efforts as conditions evolve. Moreover, layering additional administrative and reporting requirements into a process already governed by a complicated web of state and local laws 
may serve to only further hamper our ability to increase efficiency and improve delivery times. Finally, our borough commissioners and capital staff proactively provide project updates to council members and community boards and are always available to discuss capital projects in greater detail with them and other public stakeholders who may be interested. We appreciate the council's interest in advocacy regarding these topics and we look forward to continuing to work with you and your colleagues to make New York City parks and playgrounds better than ever. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I am going to allow Majority Leader Van Bramer to do most of the questioning related to his bill, but I, I just want to clarify something. So you say that you never use herbicides in playgrounds, but you on some occasions use pesticides, which I assume would be for rat control. Is yeah, right? so rodenticide would be one example of an instance in which uh, that is a pesticide but not an herbicide. Um, so, yeah, I believe containerized uh, rodent baits. And, and how, how often do you – Is there, uh, how many times a year or how many playgrounds a year do you use uh, rodent, uh, rodenticide? So I don't believe I have those numbers with me. I mean, we came uh, specifically to the bill to discuss sort of sprayed pesticides, which are traditionally herbicides. So I, I can get, we can get those numbers to you, but I don't have them. Right, but I, I thought that what your, your point was that because this is so rare, this is essentially unnecessary. Is that not your for, point? For the spraying, of, the spraying of herbicides is right. extremely rare if, but, and, and pra you know, okay, practically spraying non-existent. Herbicides. So w w uh, when it's rodent control, it is... It's not sprayed. It's a containerized... Made, essentially? Correct. Okay. Uh, and uh, remind me, the bill would apply to both. Uh, actually, no. The, the bill is the, the bill is written uh, applies to sprayed pesticides, I believe. And so your 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 statement is that there is no use of sprayed pesticides in playgrounds ever. Uh, there may be a. Uh, I think there's an instance where in insecticides. Uh, there may be a wasp, like a wasp nest, I believe, is is occasionally in a, in a tree that may be nearby a children's play area, depending on where the tree and the wasp nest are located. Um, but those are applied again directly to the wasp nest and in an in in effort to you know uh, minimize, so minimize the, the, the only nest. time a sprayed form of pesticide. Uh, pesticide herbicides are not sprayed in playgrounds ever. Yes, and the only time a pesticide would be sprayed. Is, it, is, is not for rodent control, but for some sort of airborne pest like a wasp. Correct. Is what you're saying. And could you, could you even ballpark how often that occurs? Is that a uh, 10 times a year, 100 times a year, 1,000 times a year? I mean, uh, I think it would, it, it would number in, in perhaps in the teens at, at most. Um, okay. we, we, can get, we can follow up and get the specific count, but it's exceedingly low, we'd argue. Got it. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to leave uh, further questioning on that topic to the sponsor of the bill, who I expect will be joining us shortly. Okay, so uh, on, on the topic of, of, of capital, um, what, what is the average time from moment of funding to ribbon cutting uh, for Parks Capital Projects at this point? So as we've uh, discussed previously, uh, the point at which a project is deemed fully funded is not a data point that's captured by the agency. So we're unable to determine, you know, an average length or, you know, from quote unquote funding, which can happen in various phases and manners, uh, you know, including, de you know, defunding or the rerouting or, you know, uh, rescindment of funding. You know, those are, those are all sort of evolving moves that can happen within the funding of a given project and then, you know, through completion. So uh, a point at which quote unquote it's fully funded is, is not a data point that's captured currently by the agency. It's not a data point that's captured by the agency. We're often informed that a project is either fully funded or not, right? So it's not that the agency doesn't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean by it's not captured. I, I think I'd characterize it in a way that I think the agency believes it's not a point in time at which a, a switch is flipped. It's more of a state of being, pardon the expression, that a, a project can exist and be fully funded and therefore is eligible to move forward. Uh, and, but that's a determination that can evolve and change over time. So I think the notion that there is one point in time in which it's full, you know, fully funded and some sort of clock should begin running is, is but uh, I, but something But you, you've articulated, or, or I don't know if it was the commission or someone else in past hearings, that your goal is to start design work within a year or, or 12, I think within the same fiscal year? Fiscal or year. That's right. So you know, one could argue, I suppose, the beginning of a given fiscal year in which a project is seen fit to move forward you know, but again, that's sort of an arbitrary determination and not an exact point in time in which that determination was made. 
well, so how do you even know if you're meeting that goal? You said you, again, the, the goal was either to start design during the fiscal year or, or 12 right. months. I'm not sure. So if, if a project is determined to be fully funded and it begins by June 30th of a given fiscal year, then it's begun in that fiscal year. So when it was determined to be fully funded is, is less relevant. But how do you know which fiscal year that it, fu- it was funded in? Oh, it, it would be the current fiscal year we're in. And so if a project is deemed fully funded, then it's slated to begin that fiscal year. Okay. Uh, it just it, it, It's pretty clear that at any given moment, the capital division knows whether a project is fully funded or not, right? In, so. the, in, the, in the degree to which it's on, I suppose, like a work queue or plan, that's true. Right. Yes. I mean, because we as council members often hear, sorry, we can't move forward on a project because it's not fully funded. Mm-hmm. So some, someone over there knows, right? And maybe they're not recording that movement from unfunded to funded, but sure. uh, someone there knows, the council member knows, you know, because we're, wait, we're waiting for that. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, the public doesn't know, but, uh, but it really is the moment that the clock starts ticking. It's the moment that it gets in the queue. It's the moment that you start to allocate resources. It's the moment that um, you line it up for, for design work. Uh, Etc. I mean, it's it's a very impactful moment when the money's there. No, I mean, I think we would argue that the most impactful moment is is the point in time at which we actually currently consider to be the start of the project, which is that public engagement, normally represented by a by a, a, a well advertised community scoping session to, to to commit you know commit to beginning design, outlining you know what the public wants to see out of the project. Right. We think that's really the most logical place at which the public really most fully interacts with the with the project as a reality. Okay. Um, the, the, the second best measure of the duration of a capital project, which can leave off the pre, pre-design phase, which I think you would concede is generally between 6 and 18 months. Uh, I know your goal is to leave it under 12. But even if you chop off that period, what's the average time from the time of start of design to ribbon cutting for capital projects? So it's been uh, averaging about th- between three and a half and four years. Uh, the design process roughly takes about 12 months on average. Uh, the procurement process, uh, largely out of our hands and you know, highly dictated by a complex set of you know, uh, local law controller directives, et cetera, uh, takes about nine months, between nine months and 12. And then uh, construction can range between 12 and 18 months, so say around three and a half years. Okay, so then if pre-design is, uh, I'm going to be generous and call it six to 12 months, though we know sometimes it's longer than 12 months. Yeah. And the rest of the process is three and a half to four years, right? So then, then from the perspective of the public who read about the, the local newspaper that we just got $5 million to renovate their park, uh, the time is really four to five years on average. Well, I think right? some of the difficulty in, in the notion of what you describe as a pre-design phase is that it's, it's less a phase that's undergone actively by the agency, and it's more a period during which – a given project is being proposed, discussed, considered right. by council members as they, you know, because as times funding supplied to the agency, you know, without consultation with the agency, right. you know, would one argue does that, you know, begin the clock running? I think we would argue that's, that's, you know, intellectually unfair and that without full discussion and some degree of consideration about whether the, pro- the project is feasible and appropriate and what, you know, what approximate level of funding would be appropriate to consider it right. fully funded, you know, I think that's one of the levels of concern we have about you know, and so wh- where does that – you, you, you described the time between design and ribbon cutting to be on average three and a half to four years. That, that's correct, right? Mm-hmm. That, okay. So where can I see that? Where, where, where can I st- – how, how can I you, – you, let's say you, you, you do, what, 90 to 100 capital projects a year? I forget the exact number, but somewhere in that Yeah, right, closer 80? to 150, but sure. Okay. Yeah. So – where can I see the time the, the time that those 150 took last? So the beginning, so on the capital tracker for each capital project, the when a when a given project completes a phase, right, its uh, its beginning date, which again we define as sort of the beginning, the start of design, public scoping session, what have you, uh, and then its completion date, both expected and actual, are registered and captured on on each individual project page. Okay, that so is available. The capital tracker represents the date that design started, and then ultimately <laughs> completion. Correct. Uh, and that's not compiled, but is that open data accessible? Like if I wanted to. Yes. Okay, so I don't know if someone's done the compilation and the, and the averaging, but 
Uh, what are the year-to-year -year trends on on total time? You say right now it's three, it's it's three and a half to four years. What would it have been last year and the year before? What are the trends? Yeah, I, I think I can only give the current uh, characterization. We'd have to circle back with our team and figure out a more historical data. Uh, I also think that's problematic uh, in a way. Uh, deeper historical data would probably be difficult because we only began identifying the start of a given capital design process. Choosing that point in time as, as sort of uh, technical as it sounds, that's a decision that was only made in 2000. Well, so what's the first so. year in which you feel that's a complete date? 2014. Okay. It was so the first year in which a, a start of a program. So we're now in FY18, right? Right. So we're in the fourth year. You had 14, 15, 16, 17. And now soon you'll have 18. Correct. Uh, and uh, so we, we do have four years of complete data, right? Yeah. In, in terms of projects that have completed in, in the median time frame is, is, I don't have an exact number for you, but it is within the 30 to 45 month range that we've discussed. And w so at thir 30 to 45, you said 30 to 45 months? Yeah, that's ballpark. Okay. So it's a pretty, pretty wide range. But isn't there like an average? There's a number. There's an average. You know, 150 projects. You add them all up, you divide by 150, you get how many months? Yeah, I don't have that uh, information with me. All right, but that, that seems like it would be pretty easy to tabulate. So I'm going to assume that if it's between 30 and 45, that it's 37 and a half. I, I don't know what the average is, but uh, uh, from, from design to – and but you, but you don't know what it would have been for the previous three fiscal years that we do have full data on. Uh, that's correct. I don't. Right. I think you understand why I'm why I'm drilling down. Mm -hmm. You know, we're never going to get out of this disparity between this disconnect between what we experience and what the public experiences on what feels like four, five, six, seven year timelines, mm -hmm. and what it says on the MMR, which is eighty seven percent, eighty five percent are on time, right? So uh, the, there's just a few glaringly missing pieces of data, like. The average time that the 150 capital projects took last, last year, and you know, I, I know that the commissioner has prioritized this. I know sure. he cares about this. I know he's pushed internally. He's spoken about this. Um, but until we have data mm -hmm. on progress, right. we can't pop the champagne. Sure. Right? Understood. And I think, I think one of the things we're greatly looking forward to is to amass more of these projects that have both begun and completed – under this this recent rubric, so I think it's a more about a ma as more of these projects head towards completion in the next fiscal year or two, I think we'll have a much better body of data to both discuss and present. But currently, I think there isn't. I wouldn't argue there's a sort of a, uh, a, a critical mass of those projects that have both begun under the the rubric and completed under right. those structures. So the heart of this bill, sixteen eighty, is really getting, if, if not four, at least three of the four phases accounted for, right? We, we only have one phase accounted for out of the four in the capital project process. Yeah, right? I mean... So w wouldn't it be better f even for you to at least get the three phases that we all agree have very clear start and end dates accounted for? Yeah, I mean, those are, again, I think those, the beginning and end of those three phases are represented and captured on the tracker. Those, that, that is currently available, um, and uh, I think the bill, as it's written, I don't believe would impact that. Uh, I think that is so. That is a that is a metric that is available on the on, on each project's page. Right, not on the MMR. Uh, I mean, the the shortcomings of the MMR are not addressed by this bill, but it's it's closely related for sure. Um, L let me ask about a, 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 a tangential problem of the capital process, which is um, there are cases when there are surplus funds, and that could be because um, once in a while things do come in under budget. Mm -hmm. It can also be because uh, the scope of the project changed, um, and maybe you couldn't be as ambitious as you originally hoped. And therefore, there could be fifty, a hundred, two or three hundred thousand dollars that's over. There might even be cases where uh, you had multiple funders jumping in—the borough president mm -hmm. and and the council member, and maybe even the parks department—and uh, there was some double double effort there, and so you could wind up with with surplus surplus money. Um, what happens to that money? 
Uh, so I'm less conversant with the, you know, our budget staff's not uh, present here. And, and in some ways, but I, I do know they work closely with council finance regarding uh, the rescindment and reassignment of council funds. My understanding is that council finance is chiefly responsible for tracking and making those reassignations. <laughs> uh, so I can't really speak to the exact machin machinations of how it's completed, but I, my understanding is it's a process where we're approached by council finance or, or similar central staff, and that discussion is held I believe in consultation with the council member, but maybe, maybe Look, I'm not, I can't speak to that. Anecdotally, uh, I'd like to know the protocols, but anecdotally, we know of cases where there were surplus funds and the council member didn't know, and council finance didn't know, hmm. and uh, it's a lost opportunity, um, and it, those are ultimately tax dollars, ultimately public money, ultimately th those, most of that money usually came through uh, either city council or the borough president, all of it in most cases probably. So um, it shouldn't be possible for that to live on kind of under the secret purview of the staff of the Parks Department without us knowing. Y yeah, my, my anecdotal understanding, and there, if there was an exception or two, uh, my anecdotal understanding is that Council Finance is, is quite well aware of the funding of their staff, but uh, you know, there are various projects, but if there are exceptions made, uh, you know, and those sort of, I mean, the, 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 there's at least half. I'm going to pass. Yeah, yeah. I believe that. Okay. And the, you know, the reassignation of those council funds are, are, as I understand it, need to be done with some sort of authorization from the council member. You know, I, we're happy to dig into a specific instant, instance if that happened, but we'd obviously need to kind of uh, share I'm, those I'm conversations. Allow my council colleague, uh, Council Member Mazel, to jump sure. in. Hi. G good morning. So I, I'm actually uh, just to follow through. I was going to actually ask what if you let's say you have fifty thousand dollars left over for a project. What authorization would you have to spend that money on anything else? My thinking, actually, until we had this hearing, I always thought that you know whatever was left over was, uh, you know, maybe combined into something else, which then parks decided to do on their own. No, my understanding is that generally speaking, those sort of rescindments and reassignations of council funds need to be done in consultation with council so, members, uh, I, or perhaps council finance as central staff has some role to play there. And our budget staff isn't present today, so it's hard for me to speak to those. Yeah. So, details. so basically, uh, I mean, I've had. A number of projects, which uh, very few have actually been completed. Most of the projects in my my council district was started under Councilman Fiddler, mm -hmm. and I'm reaping the benefits because everybody thinks I did it. Um, I go to great pains to explain. No, no, this was Councilman Fiddler. Um, I'm assuming my uh, successor will have the same benefit because the projects I institute will probably go into who knows when. Uh, but. It would be nice if we had a listing of what each project was, um, what it cost each project. So if, if a project w uh, was told uh, to be five million dollars, it turned out not to be five million dollars. I know if there was, if there's not enough money, would they get back to us? And they they want more. Yeah. But if, if the but the project is underfunded, uh, it would be nice if we actually had a, a listing of all the projects, what all the projects cost. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, we're happy. I mean, generally speaking, I believe our, our budget staff works directly with Council Finance, who, I, in, in that regard, to review those those types of projects regularly. I believe it's annually. Yeah. But we're happy, obviously, yeah, to, I mean, to discuss the process. I mean, do we need to say, you know, please give us, say, at the end of the fiscal year, what this is what we spent, this is what we uh, what we need, this is what we uh, have left over? Yeah, I mean, I think we're open to working with whatever, you know, uh, discussions. I, mean, I don't really know why that has to be legislated. It seemed to me that just something should no, I think matter, that, of course. No, I think you're absolutely right. I think that's something, you know, out of, you know, generally speaking, our main point of contact when it comes to council funding is the council finance staff, so we're happy to kind of expand those discussions and yeah, go from there. It would be nice to include us. Thank you. Um, council Marcone, if you have questions on anything related to the capital process or the pesticide bill, you, you uh, Give me the secret signal and, and we'll allow you to jump in. Okay, you just, I, I will try to calm down a second. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have uh, one other question. If we go back to the uh, pesticide issue. Uh, so you have a lot of buildings, and I imagine a lot of, in New York, we have our, our most common wildlife, which is uh, roaches. So I'm assuming you use uh, insecticides in all those buildings. Uh, roach traps are occasionally deployed. Uh, but do you ever spray? <coughs> uh, sprayed insects like in the bathroom, for roaches. Walk bathrooms and no, I believe it's it's our, our tre a treatment for roaches is is generally uh, traps or you know bait. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, um, 
My staff is showing me emails of, of um, updates on surplus money in our district, which um, some of it had been sitting idle for years that we didn't know about until very recently. Um, you know, we, we, we can pursue this with you one on one, but it, it, it does clear that the protocols are not airtight. Uh, I, this is not only unique to my district, but um, it shouldn't require investigative work by council finance to, to uncover that. So okay. we'll, we, we'll pursue that with you. Uh, sure, um, absolutely. Directly. Sure. Um, so so w once a capital project is fully funded, um, it sits amongst uh, dozens, maybe even over 100 mm -hmm. that are in the queue. Uh, how do you prioritize which project goes first? Um, I think there's a, a complex set of conversations uh, in terms of assessing the projects that are have been deemed to be fully funded at any given point in time, and you know obviously uh, projects that have a you know public safety concern, a sinkhole, something of that nature, uh, is usually you know uh, expedited. To, but otherwise, I it think it's more a factor of uh, geographically uh, there are teams that are assigned on our on our capital staff. And balancing their current workload with uh, skills and expertise within the staff, I think there's sort of a you know sort of com it's you know it's art not science obviously I think like any sort of managerial exercise, uh, there's a variety of you know different ways so it's it's not as if there's a score that's granted to a given project and then it's ranked somehow over but it's there's sort of a natural flow that sort of works out with projects and we and again we try to our best to expedite all of them as soon as possible. What's the current staffing level at the capital division? You know, I don't actually have those figures with me. Uh, it, it's about 500? I think it's a little more than that, but we can get back to you with a specific Okay. Time. And how would that compare to, say, five years ago? Uh, there have definitely been increases on the staffing side. Uh, funding provided by, by the mayor uh, has uh, quite generously expanded our capital design staff, resident engineer staff, and others, which we think have actually has actually led uh, quite considerably to us uh, being able to pick up the pace of these projects and keep them moving. So is it your position that... The it's adequately staffed at this point? I think we are currently assessing and constantly assessing our, our workflow. And, you know, we can always, you know, I think we do a great job with the resources we have, of course, but I think we contain, we consist, uh, consistently remain in dialogue with the mayor, OMB, and other entities to kind of discuss and address those, those needs. It's, it's not clear to me, given the increase in staffing over uh, several fiscal years, that, that that a staff resource challenge is the cause of the delays. But if it were to be the case, I think the council would be very open to additional hiring in the capital division if, if, if it would relieve bottlenecks. But at this point, having added significant staff, I think over 100, I could be wrong, uh, it's not clear to me if that's no, that continues to be a challenge, but that, that is an important question for us. Um, I'm going to pause and pass it to my colleague, Andy Cohen. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. You know, I, I am going to preface, uh, I have found dealing the, the capital's process to be very, very frustrating. Uh, but I, I, I will preface it by saying it's not, it's not just, the, it's not the Parks Department. It's not like you guys don't want to do the work or that you're, you know, that I feel like, oh, there are a bunch of slackers over there. That, that's not, I think that there's, but there are profound structural issues, I think, that are, are making this, I, I find, untenable. Um, like, a, you know, just as a preparatory matter, like I'm not convinced in the next four years that I'm going to put a dollar into capital for the Parks Department because I know that I will not see, I will not see the you know any sign of life on those those dollars after you know while my while I'm in office. Like, I'll be lucky if the projects I funded in the first year of my time in the council, if those come to fruition before my last year. I have to tell you, I'll be surprised. I'll be pleasantly surprised, but I will be surprised. Um, and again, you know, I, if, if I put my money in DEP, then I could, would yell at DEP, like, I, I, like, because I don't, I'm not sure that they are in any, that any agency is in a significantly better position than you, one way or the other. Uh, but it is uh, profoundly frustrating. I'm not convinced that the Parks Department has been completely. Uh, candid about the state of affairs uh, in in how long it takes uh, to get things done. I mean, this you know, it's a little bit of, to me, my humble opinion, it's a little bit of sleight of hand that you know. Well, if we just you know, we won't. I fund the project on July first or June thirtieth, 
and the fact that it sits in the queue for a year and a half before the scoping meeting, and you, we're, well, we just not, we're not going to count that time anymore. And look, we've clipped a year and a half off because we didn't count that time. That doesn't really actually help. <laughs> like that doesn't make anybody feel any better, or that the projects are getting done any sooner. That's just um, you know, and and tracking. Uh, you know, we could track, but I could tell you what the tracking will reveal is that like it's going profoundly slowly. That and again, these the contracting process, the the issues that the contracting process are not they're not you didn't make the rules, you know. But that I have a you know a skate park that was funded by my predecessor, that is of course now because we went with the lowest bidder who we knew could not do the job and is now bankrupt. Like like that we can't come up with a cadre of qualified bidder. Like like I yeah. again, not it's not your fault, but but like I just. It's it's insane on some level the way we do business uh, and the way that that your agency and again the city do, tries to do these capital projects like it it just defies logic if if the taxpayer really understood what what is happening uh, they would be beside themselves and also I mean the fact that we can't even it, like how much a project is going to cost it's like uh, we could use a Ouija board we would get a a, a closer estimate. Than, than we're getting now. And and I'm just, you know, I'm fortunate, despite the, my tone, believe it or not, that I, actually, I feel like I have a good relationship with the administration. Because now, when you come back and tell me we're not, you know, that we're 50% off or 100% off, I say, that's nice. Go tell the mayor, because I'm not giving you any more money. And fortunately, the mayor's been a good guy, and he's come up with the money. But I, I, I'm not doing it. I just don't care. I Whatever happens, happens. I you, you tell me, council member, we're going to build you this park for X amount of dollars. I get you X amount of dollars. I just don't want to hear it anymore. I've had too many meetings where, you know, I, I had more hair when I got to this council, and I, I'm just not doing that anymore. So uh, there's no question in that, but I, I, I did feel that, you know, the, the frustration is really is palpable. I, I was, a, you know, a parks advocate in a prior life. I, you know, I served on a friends of group. I, I care deeply about parks, and I, and I, with great enthusiasm, when I got to the council to be able to deliver capital for, to the parks department. I mean, really was one of the most satisfying things in the beginning of my term, uh, and it, it is not, it has not ended up that way as I end my first term. Again, there's no question on that, but, just I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> No, for what it's worth, we, we understand and share your frustration. There are certainly elements uh, in connection. You know, we've uh, brought on additional estimating staff, and that's that's you've you've locked on a few key components that have been really challenging for the agency and, and frustrating to us internally. Uh, and one of them specifically is just the absolute uh, explosion of construction costs here in New York City. I believe there was a, a, a construction study uh, completed a couple months ago that that determined that New York City is the most expensive city in the world to construct, full stop. I think we beat out Zurich or uh, someone like that, so um, hurry for us. But um, it, it's, a, it's a, you know, so determining how those bids will come in because it is an open public bidding process, you know, obviously that's something, you know, getting those results back, we take no, you know, we take no joy in that. That's something, again, working internally, trying to identify those additional funds. You know, we, we understand that frustration and we do our best to work with you through those. I know, but every year the testimony is the same, that, that construction costs are going up. I don't, like, if you... It should, nothing should cost what, what you tell us it costs in the first place. But let's put that aside. If you told me, you know, I mean, we, we talk about the, the $3 million comfort station. If you told me the comfort station was $4 million so that you built in an extra million because, you know, <laughs> it's a million between friends, like, but then we get you the $4 million and it's still not enough. Like, no, I think you're right. Look, I think we've increased, we've, we've tried to build in and build in assumptions and, and the, the increase in costs for these projects have has out have outpaced even that. So I think that's something we've been we've been shocked and surprised by. We're discussing internally. You know, I think there is a degree to which the discretionary funding model. I, I can understand how that is. You know, maybe not necessarily the best fit for for. So if you decide in certain in, in the future to route your discretionary model, you know, funding in certain ways, I, I think we can understand that in this construction environment, that that can be two difficult things to balance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, we've been joined by our Majority Leader and Parks Committee member, <laughs> Demi Van Bramer, sponsor of our uh, of intro, whatever number he's about to talk about. <laughs> uh, 
And I'm going to pass the uh, the floor to him. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. That would be 1466 uh, for those who are at home uh, keeping track of this. Uh, so uh, good to see you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, for, for hearing this uh, important piece of legislation, which I think uh, Parks uh, acknowledges is a real concern for a lot of families, in particular with young children, um, that whenever there is any kind of spraying or abating uh, around our parks, um, that their concern is about the equipment once all of that work has taken place. We have certainly heard from parents. Now, I, I have read your testimony. I understand that, that you believe that you're already doing a lot of this stuff. But uh, I know that when there's any kind of spraying going on in the city, um, uh, DOHMH recommends that uh, families clean their own play equipment at home, for example, if you're in a neighborhood and uh, there's cleaning, there's spraying going on, um, that, that folks are, you know, in their own backyards are cleaning their, their equipment. So I, I, I don't understand why we wouldn't do that uh, also in the parks. And, and I really don't understand why there would be any disagreement with the bill, because if we're just adding an extra layer of protection and an extra layer of, of uh, security for parents with young families who are concerned about this issue, as you know, there's a lot of concern. Um, why would there be any disagreement from the administration on something like this, which seems to me, you know, so common sense and so easy to do, particularly if you are arguing you're doing a lot of it already? Right. I believe you may be referring uh, to the, in terms of the recommendations that have been made by health, and, and we can defer to them on that, but I, but I believe you're referring to the West Nile aerial spraying, so those are sort of broadcast sprays, if you will, and that's where those. Uh, whereas the uh, the spraying of, of herbicides in in parks is never completed in or frankly even in proximity to children's play equipment. So I think we, we as an agency don't don't think there's really, you know, and there's not a point at which it would be sort of broadcast sprayed at a large enough level ever uh, to to trigger the the need to clean a specific piece of play equipment. Uh, the spraying of herbicides that does accomplish uh, is accomplished is is done with a sort of a hand wand that's that's much 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 more targeted specifically at ground level and usually at the base of the given weed. Right, but if there are parents of young children who see all of that work going on, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 then say to you uh, and say to us, you know, let's just make sure Parks goes in after any kind of work is being done like that. Um, uh, and, and make sure you scrub down that equipment uh, well. What's what's the harm in that? I mean, I guess it just I guess it stands largely as a uh, operational question that if that if herbicides are being specifically targeted and sprayed in a you know along a sidewalk, you, you know I guess uh, I think the notion that other play equipment or other elements that are within the confines of that given park you know aren't coming. Uh, in contact with the, the spray that's being applied, you know, literally three inches ab above the well, ground. Well, we have lots of different kinds of parks, right? Uh, if you look at Hunters Point South Park in mm -hmm. Lowland City, uh, uh, a lot of things sort of come together in one, mm -hmm. uh, uh, both the, the, the nature, the environment, the play equipment. You know, in some of our um, less well-maintained parks, you have certainly growths happening all over, uh, even in play equipment's part of why we're putting so much capital dollars into our parks um, because if you go to Hart Playground you see one set of circumstances and and then if you go to Hunters Point South Park you, you certainly see another set of circumstances. I would argue that given the totality of the system, uh, the the work that you're doing in all of them and, and, uh, and some of the inequities exist that this extra layer of protection uh, um, to create peace of mind for all of the parents with young children uh, is well worth the effort. And I think, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good piece of, of legislation. Uh, again, as we look at broader questions around this, uh, this in the interim is a good common sense uh, step to make sure at a minimum. And look, if you're talking about the safety of children, you can't do enough, really. Right, you you can't say, look, we we're, we're doing enough to keep the kids safe. If if parents in my district and citywide are saying, you know, let's take this one extra step, and and if you're doing any kind of work, let's just wipe down all the equipment, make sure it's clean again. 
you know, I, I think that's fair and, and, and works and is in the best interest of children in the city of New York. Did you, did you have any additional comments on that? All right. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. <coughs> I, mentioned or, I'm, I mentioned earlier that the Capital Task Force has identified Local Law 63 as right for reform. Could you explain what that law does? Um, you know, to be completely frank, um, we came to discuss sort of the bill that's being heard. So, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to mischaracterize or so I think at this point in time, especially as conversations are ongoing, uh, you know, I think that uh, we would prefer to kind of route discussion of, of that specific pieces of uh, piece of uh, local law uh, through through the task force that's currently reviewing it. So it doesn't feel like the right uh, time to do that. OK, OK. <clears throat> for, the, for the record, my understanding is it was put in to um, prevent uh, outsourcing of work without sufficient review and uh, that in practice since that work is pretty much all being outsourced it's starting to seem like it's just adding unnecessary time to projects um, it would be great if if you can get back to us just with the question of how many projects are actually delayed by that law um, if there's other work happening simultaneously then maybe there's no net savings if you roll that back but boy if we're really losing two months on a lot of projects because uh, of, of a delay to consider outsourcing when that's we're contracting out for everything anyhow that seems like it needs to be updated uh, in a big way um, just to give you an example of the kind of project we see on the capital project tracker uh, I'm looking at a, at a construction of a I guess on a, a, a roofing system and a Bronx playground um, uh, looks like a multi-site contract and Design started in 2013. Uh, there was a, a little bit of a delay there. It finished in February of 2014. Procurement started in February 2014. Uh, there was a, a year and a half delay on that phase. It ended in March 2016. And uh, there was construction started in 2016, scheduled to go three years. Um, and, and those start dates, projected completion dates, and actual completion dates of those three phases are there, which is obviously very helpful. Um, but there's no explanation for the delays. And so you have, uh, for example, procurement, uh, which was supposed to last eight months, ended up lasting uh, 25 months. Uh, that's the kind of thing that I think the public would like to understand. I realize I didn't give you the name of this. I mean, I, the yeah. contract number doesn't matter. I could read it out, but it's not about this sure. no, no, I understand. case. Um, but uh, w why not just simply list in the case, maybe it's an arbitrary uh, amount if it's delayed more than three months or even more than six months that you list the reason for the delay. Actually, at a point in which during a current phase, if a project has continued past its expected completion date, there, uh, there is some broad context that's provided, at, you know, to note that the project is delayed and to provide a series of reasons that often lead to delays. Um, so that's that's noted in some degree or fashion. I think one of the problems with I think uh, the, the notion that you're trying to get at is that some of the information would be anecdotal, in some cases speculative, and you know, so p supplying narrative information on a tracker like this can be problematic for a variety of operational and legal reasons. So I think there's a, a degree to which the tracker focuses on you know, concrete points of data that we find to be more valuable for either analysis or for just general public awareness. What, what would be the legal challenge? What do you mean? I think the characterization of a given delay of a project, you know, can be seen different ways by different people, and in certainly in you know, just this is just an arbitrary example. But if you know, if you know, contractor you know performance was one of those elements, I think there's some, there may be some appropriateness or you know, uh, legal concerns about how that's characterized. So I think, more broadly, just you know, ideologically, I think the notion that we would be describing sort of the story or narrative of how a project got where it got can be told a variety of different ways defend, depending on one's perspective. So I think the, uh, we think the, the strength of the tracker is that it focuses on more hard and fast sort of data points. Right. Look, there, there may be some subjectivity in certain reports on the causes for the delays, but there's probably a lot of objective uh, incidents that, that we could all agree on. Like if a contractor defaults, 
you know, that's, that's not subjective. The contractor defaulted. Um, so, you know, maybe this is about identifying discrete incidents that everyone agrees on that are not subjective, that would at least give the public a sense of, you know, what the heck is happening when what was supposed to be an eight-month uh, process becomes a 25-month process, right? Um, okay, so this is a very small one, but just kind of a pet peeve of mine. I've tried to navigate to the Capital Tracker from your homepage, uh -huh. and um, I've never been successful doing that. You can Google and find it through that route, but... Uh, I mean, there's certainly no, there's no obvious way from the homepage. Uh, n no one who didn't know that this existed and thought to Google it uh, would ever find it. Um, one obvious approach, and I, which I don't believe has been implemented, is if I were to go to the to homepage of a given park, and every park does have a page now, mm -hmm. um, that there might be a link there. Yeah, well, for each individual park property page, uh, if there's ongoing capital work, there that, that project is actually highlighted, uh, and there is on the sidebar. There's sort of a link that will take you directly to that part, the capital project for that that park. Okay, so so if I go to an individual park, I'm linked, but uh, if I, but but if I just wanted to find the tracker, sure. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure you're not hiding it. Uh, oh, no, I'm, no, I'm not no, we're, we're that, very very but, proud of it. The 400,000 uh, hits we've had, you know, we're, but, we're, we're delighted. I think um, uh, we'll take a look. Yeah, we're happy to consult with our new media team. I, you know, have it, I, I have a bookmark on my computer, so it goes straight there. But I understand not everybody else will have right. that. Have that. Uh, is, is there an easy to remember remember URL? Is it like, is it like, parks.gov slash uh, capital tracker or something like that? I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll explore. I forget exactly what the direct URL is. Okay, but we'll, we'll double check that. And All right, and we're always happy to discuss. Uh, you know, I, I think we have certainly highlighted it on our homepage in the past. You know, I think the homepage sort of evolves over time, so there maybe there have been times. But certainly, I believe, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, there's a row of key links up top, one of which is parks or about parks. And then of that, uh, Capital Tracker is one of the three or that four right. that sort of pops up. So it's Okay. Um, yeah. All right. I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Andy Cohen. Uh, I just have a, a follow-up. Just on, on the chairman's point, as an example, I mean, I'm harping on this, uh, my, uh, my skate park. But if you look at the capital tracker, I would not say that it is a, a fountain of information as to what the problems are there. But that project is, I mean, it just says like it's under construction, which uh, I can tell you if you go there, it's not. <laughs> hmm. um, uh, I, I'm, I, I sh maybe I know this and I just can't remember. But in terms of cat, is anything done in house? Like I know we like, and to her credit, you know, I love my borough commissioner. She really, if the, if there is a way, she finds it to be done. Uh, and there are things that we've done together where we've sort of cobbled stuff together. Are, are there capital projects that that are with like would be defined as capital projects that are done in house? I guess in terms of com the you mean the construction or the design of it? I, I, just to clarify your question. Well, I, I'm not I, I'm not sure. I mean, oh, okay. I, so uh, you know, so we have capital design staff that. Certainly, work in house to design, you know, the improvements for a playground. You know, they they're a key, uh, fe they're you know they're featured at that public scoping session. You know, they're they've got the pen to paper, you know, on the drafts board doing the work. There are times for larger, or complicated, or sometimes a cluster of it makes sense to cluster a group of projects together, and that can be uh, go out to RFP for a design consultant to accomplish. So both so the design of a project can be accomplished both with in house staff and with consultants. But you design most of the projects in. It? It's about 70 percent are completed by in-house staff of the landscape uh, jobs. Architecture is actually more consultant based. I, so I, I understand the difference. Like Bill, yeah. I understand the difference. Uh, it, but what about construction? So, yeah. The, so the construction is overseen by in-house park staff, our resident engineers, what have you. The work itself is is off, you know is the, the contractor who publicly all, all of that. it. I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, I. I suppose if uh, you know, certainly our maintenance teams, our MNO staff, like county uh, in each in each borough, like, but that's not a bench. That's, that's not like a, a work order bench. thing. That's no, not that's a, ca not yeah. a capital project. Yeah, capital We're projects by I think by definition are, are generally you know up for public bid and assigned uh, you know to a contractor. Has, has there ever been any like there are times when things that are not monumental, but like that they're more than maintenance, but they're not. We're not building a pyramid, and there's really like no way. Like sometimes like. I have a basketball court. I'd like to get. It just needs to be repaved. Mm -hmm. 
it, it could be repaid. I mean, like it should be like a fifty thousand dollar job sure. where someone comes with a truck, they pour the stuff, we make it flat and smooth, we paint some lines, we play basketball. And instead, of course, this is a three million dollar. Like there, there. If there, if we had somebody, if we had some aspect of the parks department that could do some, like I said, some more than maintenance. But you know, and mm-hmm. I understand that they don't have. Yeah, no, I actually, and, and you raise a really good point, and which is that we, we do actually have a division, our citywide services division. We commonly refer to them as five borough. And they are, you might describe them as sort of a hybrid where it's sort of projects that are sort of above just like a normal maintenance, fixing a bench, what have you. And, and they're actually, we're exploring some really exciting uh, pilot approaches in which they're taking, for example, interior reconstruction of a comfort station. So not a full reconstruction of the building itself, but sort of more of the interiors, fixtures, what have you. And I think we just, I think we just completed a, uh, a pilot in which the five borough uh, team was able to do some re- uh, interior reconstruction and improvements for a comfort station in, in Staten Island. I think that just completed, so we're still kind of going through, you know, what was the cost impact, timeline, those sort of things. So I, I don't have, you know, I don't have that information with me, but I think we are exploring opportunities uh, you know, to kind of use in-house staff, you know, in a different, that are sort of non-capital um, towards some of those improvements. Having said that, I think I just want to broadly flag that, and, oh, sorry, and, and similar to your example, I think we actually are using this, a similar team to accomplish sports coding and some sort of, re, you know, limited repaving and things like that, and we actually are exploring some in-house opportunities to, to, to avail of ourselves there more. Having said that, I think a lot of, you know, uh, to the layman, especially me, including me, uh, you know, a redesign or reconstruction project can be often much more complicated than might appear. To you know, so things like grading, you know, utility connections, uh, you know, a variety of complicated, you know, architectural and engineering decisions. So just for what it's worth, like sometimes these projects are more complicated than one might think. You know, those no, not I, a, I, to- I totally understand that. You know, like you can't get a light because the power source is right. I, you can't get what I understand that, but it. I think a, it would go a long way to building some goodwill. Like, if we could, if there were repairs, again, that are more than just a repair, but like that there were work that could be done that would put a, not take a park out of construction for five years. That would not that would allow people to use it the way they wanted to use. Like, I have people who don't want a capital project. Like, the park is in terrible shape, but they want it. They, they the idea that they would be out of the park for an extended period of time, you know. Uh, soccer fields, bas- uh, baseball fields. Like, where are we going to go if you know? I, I know the field is you know it, it it floods every time it rains. But where would we go if we if this part was taken apart? Yeah, actually, to that end, we're actually exploring uh, sort of a, an initial in, uh, internal review and study where we're we're uh, defining sort of classes of some of our properties that could benefit. You know, let's say like a, a synthetic turf field that can benefit from sort of just ongoing maintenance as opposed to just letting it you know go for eight, nine, ten years, at which point it needs a full reconstruction. So we're exploring ways, and we're, we've been working with OMB, and we've been and, uh, doing some sort of pilot approaches to see where sort of steady ongoing maintenance of that, which can be done at a much, you know, obviously lower price and is not as disruptive to the use of the field, um, how that can be accomplished, and, and we're sort of weighing where that, you know, how that has been. So we're, we're exploring very many of those options. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Cohen, and thank you to the administration. Um, we're going to pass off to our next panel which will consist of Emily Walker from the Orchestra Parks. Yes, okay. Good morning. My name is Emily Walker, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Programs at New Yorkers for Parks. I want to thank the City Council Committee on Parks and Recreation for inviting us to speak on this important issue today. Um, And I should clarify, I'm speaking about um, Intro 1680. Um, As the citywide independent advocate for parks and open spaces throughout New York City, the process of capital improvements in parks has long been of great interest to us. NY4P has long understood that the capital process for parks is a broken one, and the new legislation being discussed today reflects that deep frustration with the process, a frustration we believe is shared by everyday New Yorkers, members of the city council, and the agency itself. 
While we have stated this before, we believe it is still worth noting that the nature of parks makes them inherently more challenging to improve. There are simply more stakeholders, more varied kinds of construction projects, and a procurement system beyond the agency's control that result in some of the frustrations we've heard expressed today. Despite these frustrations, we do want to commend the New York City Parks Department on the changes it has implemented regarding the capital process. Many of these changes have made the process more transparent to the public, such as the development of the Parks Capital Tracker tool. While this tool provides an invaluable service to the public in terms of understanding the process of how parks get built, we would encourage New York City Parks to make this tool more readily available to the public through the homepage of the New York City Parks website, as it is still not quite apparent where to find this tool within the site without having to navigate to a subpage. There is valuable information kept within the capital tracker that could clarify the status of park renovations for the everyday users of a given space, but without this easy or intuitive way to find this tool, it will fail to serve its purpose in changing the public narrative about park capital improvements. Recent mayoral and council funding commitments to the capital division at parks have allowed the agency to continue to build the ranks of staff, which has also resulted in a more streamlined capital process than before. Regarding today's legislation specifically, we recognize the need for more clarity about where things stand in the capital process, especially in light of these significant funding commitments uh, that are made often by council members citywide to improve parks in their districts. We do have some concerns that some pieces of the legislation may have the unintended effect of slowing down the overall process by adding another layer of required reporting without commensurate funding to provide additional staff to take on these tasks. However, we do agree with the following changes to the tracker with some caveats. Namely, sharing information on project delays would go a long way toward accountability and transparency, but we do not feel that New York City Parks currently has enough capital staff to regularly report on these delays, so we want to flag that concern. Attaching the council district and community district information to a given project in the capital tracker makes sense, as this information, this, this is information that already exists on the New York City Parks website for each open space in the agency's purview. However, the capital tracker, again, should be eas more easily defined on the parks website to begin with. We would also like to see clarity on the reporting requirements that ask for the average amount of time for project completion, as well as the total number of capital projects currently under the New York City Parks jurisdiction. For the first requirement, it's unclear if the average would be a mean or a median, and we believe this distinction would impact the reported figure that the council seeks to know. We also believe that the requirement around the total number of capital projects is unclear as written. Since many projects in the pipeline are only partially funded, it's unclear if projects that have had some but not all funding allocated would be included in this tally. Additionally, the legislation as written doesn't stipulate how to account for capital projects that are bundled across a borough, which is a common tactic used by the agency. NY4P does believe that more steps could be taken to make the capital expenditure process more transparent, and we hope our comments today have helped the Council and Parks Committee consider ways to reasonably improve this process for both the City Council members who provide vital funding for park improvements in their districts, as well as the everyday New Yorkers who benefit from these improvements. We look forward to working with both the Council and New York City Parks on continuing to reform the system of capital projects. Thank you for the opportunity to speak, and I welcome any questions you might have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, in terms of the tracker, I mean, like, and not that I have my own tracker bill. Like, there's, you know, my, I, the keeping track of these projects is important. But, I mean, to some extent, I feel like, you know, all right, we're going to track the Titanic as it crashes into the iceberg. Like, that's interesting, I suppose, to watch. It was dramatic in the movie. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'd like to try to get uh, the projects to go faster. I, I, I mean, I, and, I, and I think, you know, you've testified in hearings in the, in the past. Um, but do you think that there's anything in particular besides tracking the areas that, that New Yorkers is, for Parks has really identified as sort of fundamental to the, the amount of time it takes to get these things done? Is there? Well, I think uh, certainly in conversations we've had with um, your team, Council Member Cohen, um, and I know with Council Member Levine's office as well, um, 
you know, we view that there are steps in the process that are out of New York City Parks' control that are more um, controlled by OMB, for instance, that perhaps slow down the, the procurement process. Um, you know, I think one concern that we heard expressed by the agency today and that we certainly hear, um, for instance, it's participatory budgeting season, so that's very much uh, a process that we are involved in organizationally and in, in, in having conversations with folks who are both involved as delegates but also at the agency level and just hearing that some of the projects that are maybe at a lower um, cost point are being rejected by contractors who are receiving those bids because they can receive more funding to do other projects that maybe have a higher price tag. I think that's something that New Yorkers for Parks believes is out of the agency's control um, but has the very real impact of slowing down the capital process um, and adding to the frustration that council members like yourselves see that everyday New Yorkers who have long advocated for improvements would like to see and have worked really hard to get the funding committed for. Um, so we think there, there's a few different layers. We don't have, I think, a silver bullet answer, and um, we certainly look forward to ongoing conversations with you about how we can try to make this process uh, more equitable and speedy for folks who are waiting to see improved open spaces in their communities. Again, not trying to put you on the spot, but putting <laughs> you on the spot. Um, you know, it, I mean, it, you know, I, I believe that, that there needs to be structural changes, mm -hmm. uh, that, that I, I don't believe that that the capital process again it's it's charter mandated it's not just it's not just parks but that there but uh, but if there were things that we could do at the parks department that that we either we could encourage the administration to do or we could mandate through legislation i mean we would be eager to do that but I mean, you know even in the, in the answer that you just gave i mean it sort of seems like we're all saying you know, parks are nice people they're doing the best they can but it's not getting done i think that's a fair point um and certainly, you know, I think that having these conversations between both the administration at the mayoral level um, and the council level, we're eager to hear how the task force is moving forward because we do think that that is, you know, one potential way. I think there, there are snags in the process on the, the city side that, that the council uh, has very valid frustrations with and we would encourage um, the task force to really look at those things. I don't want to pretend I'm necessarily the expert on, on what those changes could be. I'm certainly happy to continue conversations with um, our executive director, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, and we look forward to continuing dialogue with the council about how we can work with this process to make it better, because we understand that um, it's not where it needs to be. Um, there have been some minor improvements, but it, it is not enough. And we understand the frustrations, because we certainly hear them from the council side, but we also hear them, and in particular, I hear them as uh, the outreach staff member at New Yorkers for Parks from folks in neighborhoods who have really worked hard for years to get funding committed for projects and then still have to wait um, an, a really long time to see those projects come to fruition. Um, so we agree that we're not there yet, um, and we, we hope that we can work together to find a constructive way to uh, make the construction process a little more expedient. I won't put you on the spot any further. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Cohen and some colleagues in Albany have suggested a more radical solution, which would mirror the school construction th authority. It's creation of a parks construction authority with the idea that it would exempt the process from some of the bureaucratic burdens that we currently face. Mm -hmm. Has New Yorkers for Parks taken a position on this? We have not yet taken a position. We have had uh, preliminary conversations with Councilmember Cohen and his team. Um, it is a, a proposal that we're weighing. I think we do have some concerns, but it's something that we have not yet decided um, how we are going to, to come down on, on either side of the issue. But it is something that we are taking a look at, and we look forward to having more conversations with both you, um, Councilmember Rulavine, and Councilmember Cohen as this process. And, uh, and wh wins what are your way. concerns? I think, you know, as a, a community-based organization that seeks to empower everyday advocates, uh, so, sort of our initial read is that we have some concerns about removing the public input process, number one, and I know that's something we've expressed to Councilmember Cohen. Um, because while we understand it might make the process move along a little quicker, um, we're concerned that that might remove the ability for community members to have that important level of input in what happens in their local parks. Um, I think you know one of the overarching concerns our organization has had for years and, and still has is that part of the problem with the capital process is also just related to the fact that New York City Parks doesn't have a robust discretionary capital budget in the way that some other capital intensive agencies do. 
Um, that's something we've pushed for year after year, as you know, in the budget process. Um, and ultimately, that's an investment that needs to be made by the mayor, and, and that just isn't something that has happened. We've seen great investments that help with specific capital pro programs, such as the Community Parks Initiative or the Anchor Parks Initiative. Those are fantastic starts, but without having that flexible, large budget to really put in that stopgap funding for projects that maybe council members have put in some funding but haven't been able to fully fund in any given year. Um, you know, I think that is inherently something that New Yorkers for Parks believes is ultimately one of the things that slows down the process to um, a degree that other agencies like DEP or even maybe SCA don't have to deal with. Um, so I think for us, not having that be a component of the Parks Construct construction authority legislation is written. Um, we'd want to see that funding sort of also accounted for in the process because we still ultimately believe that is one of the most fundamental issues with the capital process um, and why it takes so long. Um, because it can't be all on the, the backs of council members to really fund these projects and make them happen. Um, it's fantastic that council members provide The Parks that Department way. does have a pool of money for capital projects, which is very small. Um, I believe it's it's other than the um, high profile programs which you mentioned, which are are really really they're wonderful, but they're one shot. Right. There's there's one infusion of capital for Anchor Parks, and and then it's gone. But you're talking about a need every year to replenish this this pool. Absolutely. And I th the last I heard it was somewhere in the 30 million, maybe the 50 million range. It was used for things like a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or reconstructing, I don't know, a bridge in a park that needed to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. Is that about the right scope? Is that about the? Is that an accurate amount, as far as you know? Is it, is it in the thirty to fifty million range? I don't know off the top of my head. I would have to double check on that. Um, if that is the range, we don't think that's enough. Um, well, I, I would agree to you on that. You can, so. you can, uh, you can barely build a bench for thirty to fifty million these days. Right. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I, can I yes, just make one more? I, I will say, uh, uh, in, in part, based on our conversation, that I think that that we're hoping to codify, like the the um, uh, uh, the scoping aspect of the the process now, which we I think works phenomenally well. Uh, going through a scope, you know, it's it's part. Of, it's, it feels a little bit like a tease sometimes, but I mean, I've been involved in great scoping meetings where com the community comes out. We really there's a great dialogue with the parks department, and we come up with a design uh, that people really are excited about, and then we never hear from it again. But I I, I think that that your input was valuable, and I think that that's one of the things that we're hoping to uh, uh, you know as you know if in the, this process moves forward. Uh, in a PCA that uh, that codifying the scoping uh, the way it is now well, the things that work mm -hmm. should be preserved uh, so I just wanted to right. give that update very thank good you thank you for that update thank and you. thank you for your testimony thank you council members and this concludes our hearing